Hey there, Knicks fans. How's it going? Welcome to Cap Rules, everything around me, cream, get the money, dollar dollar bills, y'all. My name is Jeremy Cohen, and I'm really excited for another episode. Uh, for full disclosure, if I sound like Jeff Van Gundy for Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals, um, I'm dealing with a bit of a cold. At least that's what my negative COVID tests have been telling me. So fingers crossed that it's not positive. Um, but anyways, enough about me. We should probably talk about basketball, specifically Knicks basketball. Well, let's take a step back from Knicks basketball for a second, because I had a thought in mind. You know, I've seen a lot of tweets this week and just like running ideas about the Celtics and the Warriors and how this is the right way to build a team. You know, like they built it from the ground up. They did everything correctly. It's homegrown, all this. And it's true, right? Like the Celtics and the Warriors did a fantastic job of keeping a lot of their younger players, nurturing them, developing them, and then eventually they found ways to break through and get to at least the finals if you're the Celtics um, and certainly further if you're the Warriors. But there's something that's kind of disingenuous that I feel like is getting a bit lost in the fray of it. And it's that both these teams also utilized other avenues to get these players and to make it to where they are, right? Like, we can talk about how they draft and developed, they being the Celtics, draft and developed Jason Tatum. We talk about the Warriors and how one of the most prominent players in 2015 for their championship, their first one um, with this core, was Andre Iguodala, who they signed from Denver. Or Al Horford, who was playing with the Hawks, and he made a big decision. And lo and behold, the Celtics saw a, an opening and they were able to sign him. And Gordon Hayward. They use cap space to sign him too. And, you know, of course, Hayward gets hurt. They they also found a way to what? It was, they turned Isaiah Thomas and what became the pick that was Colin Sexton and Ante Zizic into Kyrie Irving. And then that didn't exactly work out as planned. But then they turned uh, Terry Rozier into Kemba Walker, who they then turned back into Al Horford. So I think that, Yes, you absolutely do need to grow with young players. You need to ensure that at least one of your three best players is homegrown. Um, and what do I mean by homegrown? I mean a draft pick. Like You could look at Chris Middleton, who was essentially what seemed like a throw-in for the trade that got him from Detroit to Milwaukee, but Giannis, homegrown. Um, like Even the Raptors, who might be the lone exception, because... Every year there's a shifting narrative, right? When the Raptors make the finals at C, you don't need a lottery pick in order to get to where you are. Okay. Uh, C, you need to grow everything from home. You can look at the top of the draft, nail that pick or multiple picks, and you'll be fine. It works both ways. It's just a matter of identifying the superstar who's on the board and surrounding him with the complementary pieces, one of which is indeed drafted by your team. And I think that's something that gets lost in the fray amongst us as Knicks fans, as we wonder who is going to be the Knicks star, who's going to be the Knicks superstar, because at some point, the likelihood is that the Knicks are going to have to go out and get someone. But one of the three, so to speak, best players could already be on the roster, could easily be in this next draft. Who knows what it might be, but you need that at least one guy. And you move from there. And if you look at other teams as well, like the Mavs, get, I mean, they destroyed a team in game seven that had what? DeAndre Ayton, who was drafted first overall. Uh, they hit on Devin Booker, 13th. Uh, Mikhail Bridges was a great pick at 10. Cam Johnson at 11. They traded for uh, formerly known as superstar Chris Paul. They were able to make it work. But then you look at the Mavs, and it's Luka Doncic. It's Jalen Brunson, who was a second-round pick. Spencer Dinwiddie, who they traded for, he was originally a second round pick. Obviously, him and Bertans were traded for Chris Epsporzingis, who was traded for two first round picks. And they seem to be doing fine with the way that trade is working out. And the Knicks are on their merry way as well. But then you look at a lot of the undrafted free agents and just the great development that they have. Dorian Finney-Smith, Maxi Kleber, it, it, you know, the Heat, and Max Struess, Gabe Vincent, guys who honestly were castaways and the heat found them as ideal great role players and it, they just came up short which is crazy because they could have won it but 
much like with Kevin Durant and his toe on the line. They didn't. The Celtics did. So it's how do you find players without picks in places that are harder to find? And that's exactly what the Knicks should be focused on in addition, right? It's why it's great that they're trying to build out a successful G League team. Um, other than that, you know, like utilizing their young talent and then maybe consolidating in some way, whether it is the youth or the older players or honestly both, because if you can do both, then it works. But the thing that I've seen, and I also saw it a little bit with Cam Reddish this week, randomly enough, where I've seen fans who are very attached to Cam Reddish. And I get it, right? There's a lot that's tantalizing there, certainly a great deal of potential. But then it's also like, okay, well, if you were to use Cam Reddish in a trade or Quentin Grimes or, I mean, a lot of these players, really, if you were to use one of them in a trade to net you something better, is that is that really going to irk us? Like, it seems that when we adopt something, so to speak, that we then say, this is mine, and we grow to love it and cherish it, or we just really don't like it, and we just keep disliking it more and more. And how we can package a lot of those things together in some way to then get better, add the pieces, and finally build for something, that's where we get. But I just wanted to kind of have that out there because, yeah, the Celtics and the Warriors did an ideal thing. You find a superstar in the draft, you add elite role players around him. Um, and I don't mean that as a slight to the guys who are elite role players, but just something to keep in mind. Maybe you get another star in there as well. That is how you do it. But at the same time, there are other ways. Again, it's an art. It's not so much a science, but there are some baseline foundational things that you do need to have, which are scientific, if that makes sense. Anyways, uh, our first question is from Kevin Danishevsky. Thanks for starting us off, Kevin. Uh, do you think the Knicks can make a play for Ananobi? How would they get it done? I don't. Um, so I'll say this. the A lot of Raptors fans were going crazy over the Ananobi news. It's it's a real thing. I'll, it's real. Um, so it's like, okay, well, how does that work out with the Knicks? I honestly don't think it does. Um, very switchable defender. Good player. 100%. I get the sense that the Raptors, if they're trading someone like Ananobi, they're ideally looking for someone to elevate their roster at a key position, which is probably the center position. Assuming they stick with Van Vliet and Gary Trent Jr. and Scotty Barnes, Siakam, there's really the fifth spot. So, you know, you can think about, well, Mitchell Robinson signed a trade. And maybe a uh, base year compensation, our favorite three words. It's not going to help in this situation. Um, but if you're the Raptors, maybe you're just trading for an established center. Like, like maybe it's Rashawn Holmes. Like maybe it's Rudy Gobert. But I don't think that the Knicks necessarily have the missing piece that the Raptors have, which means you'd have to do a three team deal and you're going to have to find a way to, you know, the salary isn't the hardest part. Salary's fine. Um, it's more when it's Mitchell Robinson, that's where things get a little bit more complicated. So I, I ultimately, I don't think he's probably going to be an option for the Knicks and in terms of cost. I mean, if geez, if I'm Toronto, I certainly want a very good center, what top 15 center. Um, I don't mean that as a slight to Mitch, just, Again, the top 15 center who's also under contract and you don't have to worry about matching and everything or or as much of the issues that might arise. And, you know, if I'm not doing that, if I'm doing a downgrade, which if I'm Toronto, I probably am not super interested in, then I want a first round pick back. But he's a good player. Um, Knicks would do well with good players. I just don't know if this is a match made in heaven for the two teams. Uh, Reynaldo Maldonado. Hey, Jeremy, what's your thoughts on Jalen Hardy as our 11th pick? The kid looks like he can be something special. Um, honestly, as I've said before, the draft is not my forte. I can look at the stats. I can try to look at some of the eye tests, but I honestly focus more of my attention on the minutia, how things can work as opposed to what necessarily works. Hardy, he's also a little bit challenging for me to get a grasp of because of the fact that seeing as how he was a G League player, how, what does that season look like? You can't really use some of the more advanced metrics that – the Knicks just would enjoy. So getting to that point, it's a challenge for me. But listen, if you like him, uh, then that's great. I, I just don't 
it's hard for me to say one way or another for Hardy. I focus more, I think, on the the other guys who are like probably closer to like top eight, top ten, who are easier to track in that sense. And Hardy with the G League, with a lot of the intangibles, with the fact that he just um you know, a lot happens in the gym that we then don't see. There's so much missing that it's hard for me to have an opinion on him, period. But maybe it'd be a good option. Take your word for it. From Drew P. Uh, thank you for the super chat contribution, Drew. Thoughts on Jeremy Grant odds. We get the seventh pick. Uh, RJ making more money than Harrow. Hero. Ugh, damn it, John. Tyler Hero. Excuse me. AJ Griffin connections. RJ's comp being DeMar, not Wiggins. Very similar stats to three. All right. Let's break this down. In terms of Jeremy Grant odds with the Knicks, uh, probably non-existent. I think there was a time where the Knicks were interested, and then they went the Cam Reddish route, knowing that they were able to find a larger wing, kind of like a prototype, archetype of what Jeremy Grant is for a lot cheaper. Obviously, he's not as good of a player, but you're betting on upside, and Jeremy Grant, I believe, is like 28 years old. So it took him some time to really pop. Um in terms of with the seventh pick, yeah, I, I mean, maybe there's a swap you could do. Like if, if, if it's also Grant going to the Blazers and the Knicks getting the seventh pick and doing something, perhaps I don't necessarily know what's in it for Detroit though, because the seventh pick is probably the thing that they would want the most. Um, I mean, yeah, maybe it's 11 and the Knicks move up to seven, I guess. I, it just, I think the workings of it for Detroit, they probably, don't love it necessarily, but it, it maybe it's it's certainly possible. Uh, RJ making more money than Hero. I still feel like the Heat are playing chicken with Tyler Hero. Like they have some fat contracts on the books with Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, Kyle Lowry, Duncan Robinson. I don't think they necessarily want to pay Tyler Hero. He wants to start. They like him off the bench. If you are Miami is it better to try to go and re-sign Victor Oladipo? Could you package Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson and uh, PJ Tucker make a three-team deal? Tucker goes to a team in the West that needs a, you know, a four like Minnesota, Phoenix. I don't know. One of those teams. And then uh, is Hero going to Washington? Duncan Robinson going there? Is Beal going to Miami? Like there's certain avenues that they could go down, which is why I'm skeptical that, he's going to do it. But if he's cast as a sixth man, he's probably not going to make starters money. Whereas RJ Barrett is. So I'm going to go with RJ making more than Tyler hero. And I think that's the way it should be quite frankly. Uh, AJ Griffin connections. Yes, certainly a lot there with Duke, with Tibbs, uh, with his father, Adrian Griffin, and maybe the Knicks like him. You know, I, I think that this class as a whole was kind of, um, they were robbed of some development time due to COVID and it'll be interesting to see if AJ Griffin is one of those guys who needs more time. And if you're the Knicks and you feel like the player you drafted 11, isn't going to get a whole lot of time to begin with, then maybe you bring him along slowly and you're fine with that. So I, he could be a great option there. And then RJ's comp being DeMar, not Wiggins, very similar stats through three. Yeah. I mean, DeMar's, Mid range, uh, pull up mid range is, I mean, that's his office, it's bread and butter. That's something that RJ would need to work on. It's something RJ said he wants to work on. So I would hope that that's a little better. I think it's an interesting thought, though. DeMar with more spacing at a younger age, what would that do for his game? And what would it do if also he were a few years later? I mean, uh, we're saying a lot of ifs here, but I mean, Potentially, I, I do think that Wiggins' his defense has been great overall. RJ, it's something he should focus more on, of course. Um, he started off hot and then especially off ball lagged a bit. So, but that's maybe just what happens when you have more responsibility on the offensive end. You need to find a way to become a two-way talent, but he's focusing on the offense. Offense also gets you paid. If you are um, a player in a lot of ways, and he's not, you know, a net negative necessarily on the defensive end, but picking up the slack, becoming the best version of himself defensively. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think there's some certainly some overlap for sure between RJ and Demar. Uh, Ronaldo Maldonado, another one, another one. Uh, there's news the Knicks want to trade up for Ivy. You think uh, they get it done? So 
I've talked about how hard it is to go from 11 or in that range to four. It have to be one of two things. Number one, the Knicks do a three team deal where the Kings go down a few spots and a team like the Blazers or the Pelicans drop a few spots, or it's two transactions where the Knicks work out a deal with the uh, Blazers or the Pelicans, and then they make a deal with the Kings. Is it possible? Sure. I mean, here's the truth of the matter. The Knicks have eight firsts in the next seven years. They have a lot of young players. They have already what is kind of a logjam, as we've talked about, which is not going to be helped if the Knicks get another first round pick at 11. But it'll be interesting. You know, like, again, how expendable is Cam Reddish? Is Quentin Grimes? Um, Are the Knicks willing to go in and trade Emmanuel quickly or Obi Toppin? Uh, I, I really don't know. But it's the sort of thought process where when you have a lot of younger players, you got to find time for them. And if there's a move to make for this team, it feels like the best one, if you're going to trade them, is to at least package them to get star talent, hopefully in the draft. Um, But in this case, given the timing of stars and the costs and all that, it's probably easier to trade up than it is to, for example, trade for someone like Donovan Mitchell right now. So, The Knicks do need to make a swing, in my opinion, over the next 13 months. Um, This would be a good one. I I wouldn't hate it. You know, like there's a lot that the Knicks could do with this pick that I'd be pretty happy with. Uh, Trading out, trading, using it to trade for a non-star. Those are the two things that I'd really kind of be a little annoyed about. Of course, if you're trading out, it's for a really good pick next year. But as I laid out in one of our cap or no caps, that's just really a challenge. It doesn't happen very often. So if trading up's the right way, trade up, but believe in that prospect and commit to him. Um, next we have from Andrew Claudio. Hi, Jeremy. First time, long time feeling generous. So I'm offering you a chance at redemption Rangers in four, five, six, or seven. I knew this was going to happen. I knew this question was going to come up. It's a big game tonight. Lightning versus the Rangers. Obviously want revenge. <laughs> If you recall, you listened to this last time, I picked the Hurricanes in six. There's a reason why. There's a reason why. And it worked, didn't it? I'd say it worked. So, Andrew, you spent your money on me to just say bolts and five, baby. Lightning all over the place. It's going to happen. They're too good. Great, great goaltending. They're not as deep, maybe, as they used to be. But um, I'm going to believe in them like I believe in the Hurricanes. You know, elements, they're just hurricanes and lightning. And then you got to deal with oil or avalanches. A lot of natural disasters come in the Rangers way. So bolts and five. It's rock and roll. Perry Stein. What does a reasonable package for pick four look like without factoring in the Kings are dumb discount? Willing to include IQ. Yeah. So like if you're going straight from 11 to four, you might actually have to include Emmanuel quickly. And if you're thinking like, oh, I wouldn't necessarily do that. Not you per se, Perry, but just the general you like, well, then what is the incentive for the Kings to move from four to 11? If they have a chance at a star at four and they're trading down from that out of the top 10, they're going to want something significant back and they're right to want that. And if IQ is considered significant, then I totally understand why they would want it. And then it's the thought process of like, okay, well, if you're a Knicks fan, do you grapple with getting Ivy or staying where you're at, or maybe moving up just a touch, getting um, some player at eight, keeping other assets. like That's the conundrum that the Knicks have to consider, which is why if it's not going to be a three-team deal that involves Randall, it's got to be getting to seven or eight, getting to four, and that's where you're at. So those are the uh, that's how you probably get it. But if you're going from 11 to four, if I'm the Kings, I absolutely want Emmanuel quickly. I want Obi Toppin. I want a lot of these guys. Whoever the Knicks are willing to give up, then, and whoever the Kings are like dead set on, that's what you have to think about. So it hurts, but yeah, I I, I think that's a, a fair fair assessment. Um, Kevin Danishevsky, once again, thank you for the super chat. Ask John this on playback: Can BYC ever be helpful to a team trying to make a sign and trade? If so, how has this scenario ever occurred? 
helpful. I mean, it's rare to have double base year compensation. It does happen. That's when it's easier. Um, if you don't know what base year compensation is, you haven't, if you're new to it, this podcast, haven't heard about it before. Basically, it's this almost archaic rule to, I want to say, prevent players from being poached in a way from their teams where like you have to meet certain requirements, right? So like Mitchell Robinson, basically he's going to make more than the minimum. He's going to make more than a certain percentage of what he's going to, um, what he would be making regardless. It's like, it's, it's complicated and it's frustrating because this is the first year where we really, as Knicks fans have to worry about it for the first time in a while, both because of Mitchell Robinson uh, going out potentially and someone like Jalen Brunson coming in. So, This will also be covered in the Jalen Brunson cap or no cap. But basically, what you would think of like, oh, this player is making $15 million. This player is making $12 million. Those salaries should match. Well, maybe not. Because if the player making $12 million is a base year compensation person, or candidate, I guess, then it's fifty. his salary outgoing counts as 50%. So then it would be $6 million versus $15 million. And that doesn't match. So it's just a very frustrating problem that the Knicks have to deal with the biggest reason because they don't have cap space but that's okay because other teams do and they can find ways to make this work it's just you have to rely on other teams that do have cap space and work on it that way so I wouldn't say it's helpful it's helpful if you're the Knicks and you don't want to lose Mitchell Robinson and another team that does want Mitch is basically saying well we'll trade for him if the package is subpar and the Knicks don't want it then they can say well we don't want this offer Uh, We get that Mitch wants to go, but we don't want what's in front of us. So we'll work with you, but give us a deal that's actually beneficial. And that's where it then comes into play. So again, it's, it's frustrating. I've had moments where I wanted to pull my hair out because of the fact that it's like, this money doesn't work. This does, but no, this, this is a problem here. So if you at any point find your head exploding with this, um, you're in good company because I hate it. It sucks. I hope it's eradicated from this the next CBA. It's stupid. It's all these awful things. But it is. it does, to an extent, protect a player like Mitch, if you're the Knicks. It does protect Jalen Brunson, uh, if you're the Mavs. So uh, Colin Sexton, he's another uh, base year compensation candidate. D'Angelo Russell, when he went to Golden State, uh, he was a base year compensation candidate. It's also possible that Kevin Durant might have been a base year compensation candidate as well, due to the rise in cap space since his last contract and whatnot. Zach Levine is a base year uh, compensation candidate. So it's not just guys who are making next to nothing. It's just the cap keeps going up and up and up. And then from there, it's, yeah, it's only for players who are free agents, right? So um, if you're like, if you're Bradley Beal and you opt into your player option, base your compensation has nothing to do with it. But if you do a sign and trade and you've opted out of your player option, that's when you might have to deal with a base year compensation issue depending on the money involved, uh, who, who you're trading for, and whatnot. So long-winded way of saying uh, it it could help, but it's mostly for playing defense than anything. New Grizzle, excuse me, New Gizzle, my apologies, New Gizzle, uh, who is a good continuous soup guy you like on another team? Ooh, that's a good one. I would say, I mean, I've talked about Gordon Hayward. You know, so another thing I'll say is this. I have said that if the Knicks plan on keeping Cam Reddish moving forward, that trading Randall for a player like Bledsoe doesn't make a lot of sense because you're gaining cap space, but Reddish's cap hold, RJ's cap hold or salary, whatever, it's it, you're basically pushing right there. But if you wanted to keep those players and you wanted to flip someone like Bledsoe, Eric Gordon, right? Like. The Rockets aren't going to get a ton for him. And the sneaky thing about Eric Gordon is that he's got a non-guaranteed contract for the 2023-2024 season. So if the Knicks were in the position where they had Bledsoe and they were looking to continue to soup him in a way where they didn't want to extend him, because why would they? They could always find a way to call up Houston and say, Rockets, how about you take Eric Bledsoe? We'll take Eric Gordon. It's a wash. You know, because I don't even know if Eric Gordon's going to have significant time to be playing in Houston. They certainly, you know, towards the end of the season, I know they were tanking, but he wasn't playing as much. He's also an older player. So that's the type of continuous soup. I mean, 
you could even say Jalen Brunson's continuous soup if the Knicks acquire him. Um, you could say Mitchell Robinson is, but in, if we're, I, I still stick with Hayward, but for the non Hayward answer. Um, yeah. If there was, if there are moving pieces where the Knicks had, or like Gallinari, wh- whoever it is where they have matching salary back, that's expiring. I think Eric Gordon is a good continuous soup candidate. Uh, and for those who don't know what continuous soup might mean, uh, super quick explanation. Basically, if you're the Knicks and you want to operate over the salary cap and a contract is expiring, instead of letting that contract expire, you flip it for more salary. So the best example of continuous soup that I have in mind is actually the Golden State Warriors. So Kevin Durant, when he went to the Nets, he was just going to walk. And then Bob Myers convinced Durant to do a sign and trade. That sign and trade brought back D'Angelo Russell. Then Basically, they had more money to work with because if Durant had left, then they wouldn't have had any cap space because Curry and Clay and Draymond are all making money. So what they did was they took on D'Lo and then they traded him for Andrew Wiggins and what turned out to be the seventh pick overall. They ducked the, the tax so they didn't have to pay it, which was important because they're a repeater tax team or they were at risk of being one. And then they were able to make the finals with Wiggins and Jonathan Kamingo, who they draft seventh overall. And of course, they had their own pick, which was Moses Moody. So that's how continuous soup helps you. It's basically how do we let this thing keep running and running and running and let it go for as long as we can? That's the way you do it. Uh, Pastor Claudio's Obi Hive, 11 and the Dallas pick and IQ or Obi for four. I mean, again, I, I, I probably wouldn't do it. That's that's the type of thing that you have to do to get up there. If you're doing it from 11 straight to four, cutting out a middleman or a third team, that would be part of a trade. I, I know I go, it seems I go back and forth, but like I, I, that's what they want. That's what it probably cost. But then the other thing is, okay, well, at 11, do you think you're going to get a star? Do you think you're going to get a star with the Dallas pick? Do you think Emmanuel quickly or Obi Toppin is going to be a star? Do you think that if someone like Ivy at four is going to be a star or Shaden Sharp or for whatever reason, although I'm skeptical that Smith, Holmgren or Moncaro drop. If the answer is, well, yeah, we love this guy. We want to do it. We want Ivy. We want one of these other players. Yeah. But it hurt a lot. It's one of those things where I think I could eventually get to it because i'd be sold on ivy's upside um it would take some time but that's that's where the head and the heart kind of intersect right because you don't want to give it up but if if you're getting like a legitimately great player potentially at four it's it's unfortunately a no-brainer so i know i'm giving mixed signals with that so i i no, but I'd, I'd, I'd learn to love it. I guess that's the best way. Zach Smith. Jeremy, thoughts on New Orleans as a trade partner to swap 11 for 8? Wonder if they might look to trade down if their guy's off the board when it gets to 8. I think I talked about New Orleans before, but if I did not, yeah, I see them as a solid trade partner also because of their own tax situation. So they're not super far away from it. Uh, uh, they've never paid the tax. Not once. Um, that's what happens, I guess, when you run the Saints and the Pelicans. You just have a lot of expenditures. The thing with New Orleans is you've Brandon Ingram on a big contract. You just acquired CJ McCollum. You've extended Jonas Valanciunas. You need to find a way to get off of the Devontae Graham contract, most likely. And then there's Zion Williamson. And if you're keeping Zion Williamson, and he's not going anywhere, then you're probably going to have to pay him a lot of money. And if you're paying him on top of the other players I just mentioned, a lot of money and you're getting close to the tax new Orleans's thought process could be okay can we get talent at 11 that we would have gotten at eight and can we also get a future asset out of it if the answer is yes it's a no-brainer for new orleans they should absolutely do it but if it's like no no there's a can't miss prospect we love him at eight we want to focus on him i get why they would do it you know they could always offload other salary they've got other picks and you know, some of the Milwaukee picks aren't going to be super valuable. Although one of them went to 
Portland because the Pelicans made the playoffs. But, you know, that sort of thing where, like, if you had to offset some other salary, you could find ways. I think the smart thing for them is probably just to take the best player available at eight. But the NBA and their teams are run like businesses. And some owners or just governors are just not willing to spend. So if the Pelicans aren't willing to spend, call them up. See what you can do. If your guy at eight is there, and especially if you don't have to trade like quickly or Obi or any of these other players, you can trade some sort of future draft compensation. They're a great partner. I, they are certainly someone to watch. Um, let's see. This is from Steve Savale. Thank you, Steve, for the super chat. Um, what kind of player could we have gotten for Randall last summer compared to his value this summer? Oh, um, it's. You got an all NBA guy, second team, all star, most improved player of the year. You could have you could have gotten something good. The reason I know you're not asking for this, Steve, but the reason obviously the Knicks didn't make the trade or trade him away was because they didn't want to seem absolutely heartless. They also banked on him to be maybe not as good as he was, certainly, but not as bad as he was in actuality. But yeah, I mean, you know, you you probably trade him for a quality starter and a future first round pick that's protected. Uh, now I I still think that you could at least get a quality starter, but we'll see. You know, again, I'm more neutral than I, I'm sure a lot of other fans are. It's just how do you find the pieces? I think there's going to be so many. There're going to be so many trades this year because the free agent market isn't as robust as it's been before that openings might occur for Randall that on paper, we just wouldn't have thought are viable options. Um, so yeah, I'd say maybe that's around where quality starter protected first round pick pastor Claudio's OB hive. Uh, thank you again for another contribution to the super chat. Would RJ be the fifth best player in this draft? Um, I don't know. I, the, the thing with this is like, RJ is a proven 20 points per game score on the NBA level. I'm like, I'm not doubting the ceilings of the four guys that are likely to go top four, but it's also, it's just so challenging. Cause like they haven't, they haven't done it yet. Um, I just think back to the fact that RJ before Zion was Zion in the collegiate level, he was considered the number one prospect in the upcoming draft and he was obviously eclipsed john morant had a phenomenal season and he went third which i think worked out for the knicks compared to obviously deandre hunter at four or we could talk about garland but i still like rj's upside even though garland's a fantastic player i don't i don't think he'd go fourth or fifth I, you know again it's there's some great talent ahead of him but the scoring, the size. I understand why these other players are as heralded as they are. But like, I, again, I, I'm of the philosophy that you need a great wing. You need great players, period. But I prioritize wings personally. I don't, I, I think it's great to have these star guards or star bigs, but give me a star wing. So I don't, I don't know if you go fifth. I think for the sake of it, I think you'd go higher than that. Um, Adebambo, uh, Adejobi is Jalen Brunson worth the serious overpay? I don't think so. Also, we'll be getting Levine cap or no cap. LOL. Um, let me start with the second question. We're not going to do Levine cap or no cap primarily because I don't understand why Levine would want to come to New York. You know, like it makes sense if he wants to go to a team that has a win now star or superstar that also has had consistent success or is on the rise. Like, Portland, near where he's from, in the Pacific Northwest. Dallas, even, if there's a way to make that happen. I just, they're better options than the Knicks. So, I, I, yes, I could, but it's just the sort of thing where it doesn't, it just doesn't have legs to it, at least in my opinion. Uh, and as for Brunson, we'll talk about him this weekend, but the funny thing is I, I don't see him as an overpay. I think it's the sort of thing where the Knicks have neglected 
the point guard position for so long that I don't really care too, too much about the pay, right? Like there's a, there's a stopping point, hundred percent where you don't want to go over that. I understand that that amount is different across the board for fans. For me though, I look at what he's done this year. I think he did a phenomenal job in the playoffs. A lot of the knocks against him with his height, with his abilities, where it's not going to carry. Yeah. Did he have Luka Doncic? Of course he did. hundred percent. But he was also the second best player on that team. And I think he did a phenomenal job doing what he was doing. So to me, it's like, it's not an overpay if you can get a premium talent at a premium position. What do I mean by a premium talent? Well, it's like, again, is he a top 15 point guard? Is he top 20? How many of the best players in the league um, or how many of the best point guards are making under $20 million or not on their rookie contract? Not a ton. A lot of these guys is market value. It just is. And I feel like if Jalen Brunson were on the Knicks, we would be putting him in the same emotional capacity that we put so many of these other young players. But it, he, but he's not a Nick. So he, he's foreign to us. And we don't love him as much. But if he were here, I think we'd love him immensely. Look at Mavs fans. I, I mean, I, I've seen Mavs fans just from casually checking Twitter. They want to give him five years. They want to get, they're willing to give him $25 million, right? Why? Because they want to retain talent. Because they see him as a good player. Because that's the cost of business to having a good player on the team where you can also move him at a certain point if that's where it eventually winds up. So to me, it's really not an overpay. But we'll get into that more. We've got a couple conversations coming up that I'm really excited about, but we'll address that. Um, from Daylock, Jeremy, what are your predictions on Mitch walking for nothing versus a sign and trade that nets us at least some kind of return? I would say... So John and I went through all of the teams. Again, things could easily change based on where they're at currently. Detroit is fascinating to me because if they're super in on Aiton, Mitch is essentially off the board. And if they get Aiton, maybe they don't. But if they did, who knows? Do they then decide, hey, well, we're willing to pay $30.5 million to DeAndre Aiton. What's $12 to $15 million for Mitchell Robinson? And then it gets to a certain point where it might be too much. And now I understand you might be watching this or listening. And you might be thinking, well, Jeremy, I don't fully get it. You're saying that there might be a point in which paying Mitchell Robinson, you walk away, but, but Jalen Brunson, maybe it's not as clear. And again, there is a price point for Jalen Brunson. I'll clarify that. I, I want to clarify that. But based on how the roles are played out, how important it is to have guards who can pull up who can pass, who can make plays, who can run the pick and roll to an elite level, right? Who, who can do these things that maybe a center doesn't do. And, and that's not to take away from what Mitch does that's really good. He does some fantastic things. He's great on the offensive glass. Incredible field goal percentage because he's got great hands at the rim. Um, he's a good defender. Great shot blocker. Like, there are attributes that are important. The question is, how replaceable is Mitchell Robinson versus you know someone like Jalen Brunson? And we've been trying to take the easy route from the point guard position for God knows how many years. Uh, it's a lot easier to take that route with a center. Not saying it, you should. Again, I think there's a right price for Mitch. But unless, you know, like, are we are we talking about more than, I think I said four years and 46 million guaranteed with like six or so that's in unlikely bonuses? I would sign up for that in a heartbeat. I think that's also where I'd probably stop. But you have to have a contingency plan. You can't go into next season when they're Lins Noel. You can't have Jericho Sims start it. You can't draft a center uh, and have him start. So there has to be a player you take instead. That's, I think, where Mitch also has leverage in terms of, well, if I'm going to go, who are you going to take instead? And the Knicks have to be prepared for that. Um, from Zach Smith, if your dream trade scenario happens with Hayward, <laughs> it's funny how that's, I'm not begrudging. It's like, it's just funny how like the idea of me wanting Hayward has transpired into a dream. And like it, it's, it has, I guess, but it's more if the right price comes up, but yes, yes, a hundred percent. Uh, so if that trade happens, how many games does he play in the season line at 41 over under, I'm going to say over, but not by a lot. You know, he's, I think he's missed like close to 30, a little over 30 a year. 
I think he can play a full season, but you know what? Uh, not a full season. Excuse me. I think he can play half a season. Definitely won't play a full season. But if he plays more than half a season, it's probably a success. It is a success. And if he misses time, then who's going to step up? Is it Grimes? Is it the player they draft? Is it another player? Who knows? But that's at least the way to go about it. So I'm going to take the over, but not by a lot. Not by a lot. Uh, from Parrish Duggar, thank you for the super chat. Under no circumstance do you trade IQ, OB, Sims, Grimes, McBride, RJ, Cam, or any of our 2023 picks until we see them together 40 games, period. Um, I, I, I disagree. I respect wanting to keep the core together. I want to see a lot of these guys, but I think we also have to be somewhat practical in terms of like, you're going to be investing big money into at least two to three players. It's going to happen. They're going to be playing. Okay. How are you going to be able to then fit these other pieces around? At what point, I mean, at what point do we then say, well, their value is better now than it was before. Every team at some point makes decisions that hurts. It never happens where every player on the homegrown team moves on. Is it like you can have a core of these guys, but it's very rare in that like every single player who you have stays. Like, I mean, even the Celtics, we could point to them. Like, they've had some not great first round picks. They traded Romeo Langford. He was taken 15th overall, I believe. They kept most of their guys. And they've done a great job developing internally. And that's why they're there, partially, mostly. But for the Knicks, I mean, I, I, I think at least two of those guys are expendable for sure. We don't have to see all of them together. It's, you know, like if Cam Reddish were traded at the draft, excuse me, at the deadline where it was rumored he was potentially being moved to LA. I think that a lot of people would have shifted their focus over like, oh, well, look at the first round pick that the Knicks would have gotten from the Lakers. It's going to be a great pick. It was worth it. You know, that sort of thing. It just depends on what comes back. I'm all for trying these things out and for playing the young guys. But at a certain point, you might have to deal with the log jam. Probably do. And how do you then navigate that? And also, if you can consolidate two of those guys into a really good player that also fits the timeline for what you want, why not? And how healthy are they? Like how how likely are we to see them for forty games where they're all healthy? Is the Mavs pick going to be great? It's Dallas is picking twenty sixth this year. Are we? Do we want to hold on to a pick that's probably a replacement level player, as history indicates? So, uh, Parrish, that's where I'd say we disagree on that. I I want to prioritize the youth one hundred percent. I just am less adamant, I suppose, about keeping all these assets and players. Um, I'm willing to consolidate in some way, but it has to be for the right deal. From Frank Sound, question: Shouldn't teams like us just draft two-way wings and small ball bigs, then guard every uh, that guard every position? That's what a great team needs, it seems. Yeah, I mean versatility is certainly the name of the game, but it's hard to find two-way wings and small ball bigs that can then also have the level of star potential. Like if you could trade for those players as well, then I think that's something to consider. That's where fit certainly comes into play, but you know, like it's harder to find those players in the draft. They have to be there when you're picking or you have to trade up for them. And if you're trading up for them, what's the opportunity cost involved? I, it's a challenge, but it'd be nice. Yeah. It'd be nice to have those, those things. I, I said, I think last week that I feel like what Grant Williams is doing a uh, great player, really, really great role player. Um, but it's almost like there's this now narrative of the three and D guys, you know, like the three and D wings, that same thing is being put on players like Grant Williams, where you, you want to have those types of guys, but I'm, I feel like we might see a shift in teams that are going to overly prioritize that position because he's a good player because they want to find someone like that. But yeah, ideally you're finding the best player available who is or who meets those qualifications, those criteria. Kevin Danishevsky, I'm almost gagging asking this, but is there any way Kyrie Irving ends up here? I don't think so. I, I I'm very skeptical. And I think also, if you're Kyrie, you come to the Knicks. First of all, I don't want Kyrie. 
just not worth it. Uh, but secondly, if you're Kyrie, what do you what are you basically saying? Like, yeah, I'm like I want to go to the other team. I should that I probably maybe should have gone to in the first place, considering how things are going with the Nets. Um, it's I, I don't see it. I'm glad that I don't see it because I just don't want it. It would. Yeah, everywhere he seems to go. It just seems like there's some sort of issue that pops up. It's just not my choice. So, no, I'm just going to I'm going to say even if it were possible and it is possible, but like even if it were even there was a likelihood to it, okay, I'm just going to say no. We don't need that in our lives. Uh, Tariq Ali, what would a trade like Gobert for Randall look like? This is if we let Mitch walk. Yeah, I mean, it'd be Randall and some other matching salary, like Burks. It'd be a young player. Grimes. It'd be a first. I, I think that's that's a good starting package. I think that's probably closer to what, again, I don't know if Utah even wants this, but like, that's at least getting to where they would want it. it. It satisfies multiple needs. You get a veteran who can help you. You we get two veterans. You get a quality young player. You get a first round pick. Of course, is another team going to come in with a better offer? If they do, are you willing to surpass that? I'm not considering the age of Gobert and what he brings. I think he's a phenomenal defensive player. Um, I wouldn't necessarily be on board with it. Not even necessarily. I wouldn't be on board with it. But I think that's at least the type of package that gets you into the conversation because it satisfies the criteria. Um, uh, Parrish Duggar, thank you again. Uh, together is when they play magically well together. Yeah, uh, I hear you. It's just, I hope it happens. It'd be great. I, I'm i just looking at history, and these guys get split up earlier than, than often. And I think the reason that it happens, too, is because your value might, I mean, you're sure you could value, your value could easily rise. A lot of times it drops. And then like Mitchell Robinson, I know that a lot of fans are like, Oh, well the Knicks should have sold high on Mitch. Like, sure. A hundred percent. If you've been listening to me for a while, I, I've had my skepticism in general about Mitch and what he can bring to the table in terms of, can he be here when the Knicks are a contender, but the Knicks aren't a contender. So they're still building and I hope he can stay. But then the question is, okay, well, if you're going to trade him, or if you were going to trade him, when would it have been? It would have been at the end of the second season, right? And I think the the Lamelo and the eighth pick, uh, Lamelo for the eighth pick and Mitch, like that is, I don't think that was a trade that was ever truly offered. And I see fans oftentimes being like, oh, the Knicks should have made that pick or that trade. And I just don't get how it was even on the table. Like if you are. Sure, Wiseman's not working out for the Warriors, but at the time, even like you don't trade from two to eight for a good reason. And so, how how would fans have felt if Mitchell Robinson had been traded for that? Obviously, it would have been great because it would have been too good to be true. Last year, yeah, probably should have made him a restricted free agent, unless they feel like going under the salary cap, in which case I understand why they didn't. But you have to move these players. When it hurts as well, it would hurt now. You'd probably get better value. And if you waited then and they get better, then you don't want to trade them. You want them to stay because you see them remaining here, but they could also net you something better. So um, it's like a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, unfortunately. Trizzy H, question. What does a trade look like for Kemba this summer? How does that look cap-wise? Uh, probably for expiring matching expiring salary. It's part of why I, I figure he could work out for Hayward, even though Hayward is not an expiring contract, but that's then the allure of why you would do it. But yeah, you know, like if you can find a team that's willing to take the upside, and I know that seems silly, or at least a floor, let's say floor, of something like Kemba and Noel, and they've got a player who is unplayable, like a player like Bledsoe. Um, maybe it's Eric Gordon. Like that sort of thing where you can trade two contracts that add up to like $18 million, $19 million for a player who's not going to give you a whole lot, who's making $18 million or $19 million, who could potentially be an expiring contract. That is the path that I think you go if it's not 
trying to package for a Hayward type contract. He's making $9 million Kemba Walker. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's as tough to move him as people think. It's just, what's the returning package? Just, you know, you want to find a good home for him too, but at the same time, you just, you want to clear up the log jam and other teams are facing similar issues with players that I'm sure they'd love to move. So I don't think it's impossible to move Kemba, especially at his sal- salary as it's expiring. I just, uh, just has to be the right deal. And if it's not the right deal, you have to figure out how you can turn that deal. If it's the best one into the right deal. And that's where the added layer comes into it. All right. Uh, Steve Savale, in your opinion, Randall versus Obi, can they realistically play together or does one have to be moved this summer? Ask Tom Thibodeau. If he's not going to play Obi and Randall together, then I think we have our answer. And if he's not going to play Randall less than he already is, it's a bit of a problem. And I don't see how Obi can function here. I don't see how Randall is in a position to succeed as well because if the Knicks and their fans, specifically the fans too, want Randall to move on and want Obi, it's going to be rough. He's going to hate it. It's going to be more outbursts. A lot of just frustrating conversations. So I would hope, considering how if they can't play together because they get crushed on the glass, move one of them and don't move Obi. Uh, and then this will be our last question for the evening. Is from Johnny Chiba. Are you still down with Benny, Johnny D, and Eason as draft targets, or has your opinion changed since last week? Thank you, JC. Um, I'll plug draft class with Chris Persian, and he's certainly more entrenched in a lot of the draft prospects. Again, from my run of the mill, hey, uh, I, I'm going off of like some stats and a lot of vibes. I I, I still really like Benedict Maturin. Matherin, Matherin, yep, Benedict Matherin, um, Johnny Davis. I, I think the two way play there is important. I, Eason apparently has not been impressing as much, so I'll swap out Eason. I'll go with Jalen Williams, out of um, forgetting he's on the West Coast. West Coast player, a lot of great intangibles that are there, a lot of length. But again. Like that's that's my personal top three. I don't need any. No one should necessarily subscribe to that opinion per se. But if you want to, you are certainly more than welcome to. Chris though has been doing great work with a lot of the con- people he's had on board talking about these prospects. So if you haven't listened to them, highly recommend it. And um, with that, I want to thank you all so much. I appreciate you all sticking around, even with my voice not being a hundred percent. So thank you. Uh, some things to plug. I know we've got some great interviews coming up. John will have you covered with something on Friday. Um, then we will have Chris on Saturday with another episode of Draft Class. And then after that, we will have the return of Cap or No Cap. And then after that, it will be a special episode. I don't want to say too much about it, but I'm really excited for it. It should be a lot of fun. And uh, we'll go from there. But in the meantime, stay safe. Stay cool. Thank you so much for joining me, and um, let's hope for a stress-free Knicks week, right? Stress-free Knicks week? Yeah, let's do it. And Bolts in five. Talk to you soon.